so our house was one of the houses that uh, was part of the progressive dinner last night and so we had dessert or actually well dessert number one so dessert number one was our house and uh, they were as we were getting stuff ready we were all preparing and and one of the desserts we were making had opportunities for all of us to be doing something so Piper and Andy we've created this little assembly line and Piper and Andy are working on stuff and I'm working on it and Sarah's doing stuff with it and getting it all ready and I stop and have this moment of you know this is this is one of those memories that's special right and one of those memories that you hold on to and how many of those sorts of memories are woven together and connected to food right how many of those memories are, are have food as a part of it so that later on much in the same way you hear that song and you're instantly taken back to that time in your life when you eat that food you remember what that is uh, so for example my dad always made the scrambled eggs when we would have big breakfast my dad always made the scrambled eggs and he put uh, and they were amazing scrambled eggs because he would have already fried the bacon and he put the bacon fat in the eggs and and so, uh, shockingly, they tasted good, you know, and with enough cheese and bacon fat, you can make eggs taste pretty great. And so, he, so that's the, that's the recipe, and that's Pop's eggs. So, uh, I'm not the only one. Piper also loves Pop's eggs, and Pop's eggs are the, just the most amazing eggs in the world. So, when, uh, I've done it too, but it's more fun watching Sarah. When Sarah makes Pop's eggs using Pop's recipe, and we have them, Piper says the same thing every time. She eats it and goes, oh, mommy, you do an amazing job making eggs. Well, well, thank you, Piper. They're almost as good as Pops. Oh, oh. It never gets old. So, um, so that's, and, and we, we started talking about what are sort of, what are some of the food memories you have as we're preparing all this stuff? What are some of the food memories you have? And the first thing that stuck to my mind was we would always go to Daytona Beach. We grew, I grew up in Georgia. We'd go down to Daytona Beach, Florida. That was fancy for us. And so we would always go out to this fancy restaurant and the fancy restaurant's name was Marcos. All right. Now you knew it was fancy because the napkins were made out of cloth and they and they gave me one of the ones made out of cloth and you knew it was fancy because they put a salad in front of me okay all right sure why not so I'm picking it around and then and and I wouldn't have remembered or cared about it but it's what happened after the salad went away because I remember the very first time after the salad went away this lady walked around carrying ice cream and she said would you like one and I looked at my parents, and they had already gotten theirs. And I thought, this? What is happening here? So, of course, I grab one, and it's sherbet to cleanse your palate. Right. I don't go to a place now that cleanses palates. But, so, but in the moment, I, th I remember thinking, man, if you get ice cream after salad, this is a fancy restaurant. This is nice. <laughs> And so, I, you know, all of these different memories and moments and these different foods that sort of pop up. And uh, as, as we have already talked about, food plays an important part, not just in each of our individual lives, but in the life of our church as well. We are in the second part of a series that I've called We Are CPBC. And the idea behind this series is both for people who have been here your whole life to remember and reflect and say, yeah, that is who we are. And for people who are new to hopefully be able to put frames and words on part of what makes us the way that God has made us. And so part of the way, and, and when I announced to people that I was going to do a series, we were going to talk five weeks about individual characteristics that made College Parkway special. I can't tell you the number of people who came up to me individually and said, you're going to talk about cake, right? Because that's part of what makes us special is cake. You're going to tell me you're going to talk about cake. So yes, here's the cake sermon. So Food is a big part of what we do. Now, obviously, uh, when one, food is one of the ways that we celebrate. When we have a baptism, when we have some sort of good celebratory thing that goes on, we always have cake. Food is also, you know, one of the ways that we take care of each other. You know, when someone dies, what is it that you bring them? Food, right? When someone has a baby, what is it that you take them? 
food, right? Which, by the way, we're going to have some opportunities to do that. So uh, when we get, but it's not just in times of crisis or times of celebration. Every Wednesday we gather. And one of the most important things we do every Wednesday is we gather at those tables and we eat. And the only way we have that happen is because of the dedicated team of people every Wednesday who make that happen. They serve us and allow us the opportunity to gather around the table and eat. Without meaning it, food also has shaped other aspects of our life. What are the, thi- what are the ways in which we serve here at the church? Well, uh, once a year and on our property is housed what? My brother's pantry, which does what? Feed people. The, big, the two big mission emphases that we had this fall were what? Winter relief. And the big emphasis of what we did with winter relief this fall was what? Feed people. And then the other one was backpack buddies, which every week... 18 middle schoolers, 17, 18 middle schoolers get a different bag filled with what again, friends? Food. Is there a theme running through here? I think there might be. That this is part of what we do, you know, and it's not just all of us together that do it. I hear so many of you talk about, well, I got together with the whoever's and we went out to eat or we got together at somebody's house. That this sort of stuff happens not just here collectively, but we find ways that we connect because food is important. It's not just linked to memory. It's also linked to spiritual formation. God could have created any system at all for us to have the fuel we need to survive, right? We could have plugged ourselves into a wall like your iPhone does. But God created this messy, unique, very sort of holy way of refueling yourself in a way that not all, that's not just about getting the fuel in you, but also in how you are formed, We gather at the table, and in fact, one of the most important tables we gather at is this table, when we take communion. Because when Jesus wanted to drive the point home about what was going to happen, he shared what with his disciples? A meal. We gather at the table. We gather at the table, not just because we're hungry and we get grumpy if you don't feed us every few hours. We gather at the table because this is part of how God shapes, forms, and moves us. Food very rarely is just food. Food very rarely is just food. Food, and that's not new to us. Food and how you choose to eat has been a big thing. So the stereotypical wedding reception, right? That's as much about where you're sitting as it is about the food, right? I can't believe I'm at table 10. Are you kidding? Have you seen who else is at table 10? That's the level of friend I am to this person. You know, all of these sort of navigating kind of things aren't new to us. This sort of way that we fight over what food really means, we find it all the way back in Scripture. In fact, this is one of the uh, stories that Jesus tells. Our Scripture today, Luke 14, starting in verse 7. If you uh, have your Bible, you, invi- you are invited to follow along. You can find a Bible under the seat uh, in front of you, or you can just listen as we read from Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 7. Now here's what's happening earlier. Uh, Jesus is at the house of a prominent Pharisee. The Pharisees don't like Jesus, uh, but Jesus is there, and Jesus is watching what's going on. And Jesus, in his very Jesus-y way, observes how people are behaving, and then creates a little object lesson out of it right, in, right on the spot. Verse 7 of chapter 14 of Luke. When he, that is Jesus, noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. Now, in a way that our culture doesn't understand, the mo- you know, in our culture, the things we value are winning and losing, rich versus poor, that sort of thing. In this Middle Eastern culture, and in fact, in a lot of 
lots of Eastern cultures today, shame and honor is the most important sort of dynamic that you have to, the worst thing in the world is to bring shame upon yourself, upon your family. So the worst thing in the world is to take a seat at the head table, table number one, and then have somebody come up and go, what on earth are you doing sitting here? Get out of here. That sort of shame, that sort of humiliation, it's more than just teenage cafeteria kind of, oh my goodness, I'm sitting at the wrong place. This is deep in their bones embarrassing. Okay. So, verse 10, but when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, so this part right here, I've always had a little bit of, a tr- little bit of trouble with. Don't tell anybody. But um, because it seems like Jesus is telling you how to game the system. Right? Jesus is saying, listen, if you really, I mean, if you really want to wind up on the good end, what you need to do is go sit at the worst seat. And when somebody says, what are you doing down there at the kids' table? Come on up here. Oh, oh me? Okay, sure. <laughs> the Greek breaks this down a little bit better because that doesn't seem Christian at all, right? That's the absolute opposite of what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to glorify ourselves. We're not trying to find the life hack so that we can have the best glory and the most attention. Now, the Greek here breaks it down and makes it a little bit more clear that this parable, what Jesus is talking about, is when you do this sort of thing, at the end of all time, what God is going to do is recognize those who have humbled themselves, and they will be the ones who are exalted. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Not a way that you can game the system so that everybody can see how amazing you are, but an attitude and a lifestyle where you decide there aren't, you you haven't decided that everybody at tables two through eight are lesser than you, and so you deserve to be at table one where you don't get to decide based on where someone's come from, based on what someone makes, based on the skin color, based on whatever, you don't get to decide that you have more worth than other people. This is the attitude that Jesus is talking about. So, verse 12, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Remember uh, from our award-winning Beatitude series last summer, we talked about best, blessed being not um, you're going to be happy, but that you will find you are right exactly where God wants you to be. Hashtag blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Okay, so here's what's happening here. Jesus is looking around and seeing everybody playing power games with where they're going to sit, with where you're going to eat. And Jesus says, no, this is not what you are going to do. What you're going to do instead instead is to flip that on its head. How you are going to treat this meal is not as a way so that you can earn more powerful prestige in the eyes of everybody else. You're going to find people that you can gather to the table who have no chance of repaying you. People who aren't playing that game because they've already lost that game. You are inviting to the table people who other people have decided aren't worthy of sitting there. When you gather at the table, you are welcoming all because you are remembering that you are all equal under God's sight. When you gather at the table, what you are doing is not entering into that complicated, unspoken relationship of, okay... They've invited us to their house, but they only invited us to their house for lunch. So now that we've invited them to our house for dinner, and they've come, so now we have to wait until they respond again and invite us back to their house before we can invite them. You've got to let all that go. That's not what Jesus is interested in. That's not what the meal can be. What Jesus says is this meal is an opportunity for you to serve, an opportunity for you to rightly place yourself under the power of God and rightly place yourself in relation to others, where you remember that you aren't better, you aren't more than, you aren't more than somebody else for whatever reason. What God is inviting you when you come to the table is to share equally 
in what God's, in what God's bounty and provision and blessing is. Because there is more than enough. There is always more than enough. So, when we gather, whether you know it or not, what we are doing is being spiritually formed. When you sit around the Wednesday night table and you share and you hear about the life of other people, what you are doing is you are finding and you are connecting. You are building, you are drawing closer where you can better love that person and better love God. When you do these things, when we give food, when we are, uh, when we are delivering food to people and we are doing it with the mindset of, you know, here we go, we love you and you are in this hard place, let's find a way that we can help you because of the excellence we have. When you are inviting friends to your house for dinner and you reject that mindset of, all right, this is three in a row that I've invited you over here. You need to really get at it because I'm expecting steak at your house next time. You know, the, when you reject that, what you are doing is being more, being shaped and formed in the image of God. We don't have cake every time somebody's baptized just because we all have sweet tooths. That's the wonderful byproduct. We have cake because we celebrate and we rejoice. And one of the ways that we come together, we come together around the table that has chocolate milk and donut holes. We come together around the table that has Martha's hamburger casserole. We come together around the table that has all the food you make when someone has died and you are grieving. We come together because that's what God invites us to do and what Jesus modeled for us is that you come together because that draws you closer to each other and it draws you closer to God. The other thing that happens is that us choosing to focus on this makes us countercultural now. Because the average American eats one in five meals in their car. That's depressing, right? Except I did that. So, uh, okay, how many Americans eat at least? one fast food meal a day. This is bad. One in four. One in four Americans eat at least one fast food meal a day. And less than a majority of, Mar a majority of Americans for most of the week don't eat together even one meal with their families. When we say, no, show up, sit down, eat. Take a minute. We're having a potluck. Come bring whatever you have and let's all eat together. What we are doing is we are going against the culture of more, faster, 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 and we are saying instead that there, it, this is more than just fuel for your body. This is spiritual formation. When we gather at the table, whether we are gathering at Jesus' table taking communion, or whether we, whether we are gathering around the Wednesday night table, what we are doing is being shaped and formed into God's image because we are remembering that we are growing closer, finding ways that we are loving each other more fully, and finding ways that we are loving God the same. That's what we are trying to do, and that's who we are called to be, because what it means to gather at the table isn't just that I'm here to eat and eat as quickly as I can, and then I'm gone. What it means to gather at the table is to stop, and to breathe, and to pray, and to remember. You are being formed and shaped. God created this way that we get the sustenance we need because there is so much more happening when you do it. So, how will you gather around the table this week? Will it be in a renewed focus on getting your family together to eat meals around the table with no electronic devices on? Will it be that you are taking the step to invite that church family that is sitting right here that you don't know very well, but God has put it on your heart that maybe you should reach out to them? Maybe you should go out to lunch together. Maybe you should invite them over to your home. Are you going to be brave and to take that step? Is there a neighbor who you know would be blessed if you made a batch of cookies and took it over and just said, we love you and we want you to have these? How are you going to gather around the table this week? Because it's not just a waste of time. It's not just, you know, 
uh, I just have to get through this. This is an opportunity, and this is part of what makes us special, is that we don't just go through the motions. We celebrate these things. And part of why we do that is because this is how God shapes and forms and move us, moves us. We gather around the communion table together. We gather around the Wednesday night table together. We gather around the donut hole and chocolate milk table together. We gather together on the table at Winter Relief with those, residents, with those guests of, that are there for Winter Relief. We gather around these tables because this is who we are. We are CPBC and we gather around the table. Would you pray with me? God, we give thanks that you have given us this mechanism of meals together so that we can get not only the sustenance our body needs, but also we can grow closer to you and closer to each other. God, we pray that we will have the courage to slow down, to stop, to see how the ways that we choose to eat are spiritually forming us. We give thanks, God, for who you are and for what you do. And we pray, God, that you will help us to follow you in all the choices that we make so that we can better proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.